as you can probably tell by my accent, I'm originally from the US, uh, from Indiana to be precise, where I went to university and I studied 20th century Eastern European history. So I think you can all see that I'm clearly qualified to be standing in front of all of you today talking about water issues here in central Mexico. Now, I come from a family that's always focused on service to others. And when I was trying to figure out what that means, um, I remember the words of my grandfather who said, look, marching in the streets in protest is fine. It's important. But if you're not doing something to try to improve the lives of real people every day, then you're missing the point. So since I was 17 years old or so, I've been living and working on and off in various parts of, of Latin America, trying to figure out the point for me. And uh, before I ultimately landed here in Mexico a little over uh, a decade ago. Now it was back in 2009, I was working on a sustainable construction project with my father in Chiapas, Mexico's southernmost state. Um, and I was traveling between the US and Mexico quite frequently, really disconnected from the context and the culture of everything that was going on. Now because of this, the project ultimately didn't take off. And uh, we only later realized that we were coming to these communities with a solution to a problem that they didn't identify with as a problem. Now, about a year later, I found myself here in San Miguel uh, with a bunch of other people who were doing similar development-based projects around the world and were just as disillusioned with their impact. So we decided to start looking for a better way to do this work. Um, and we realized that so much of our failures were due to disconnection. We needed to create a much stronger bond between the technologies we were developing and the people in the communities we were, we were seeking to impact, a marriage between technology and humanity. So that's when we developed some really simple core philosophies to kind of help us on our way, to help achieve that ideal that would ultimately become the, the foundation of Caminos de Agua. Now the first is quite simple. It was decided, we decided that we simply have to live where we work. Um, I know it's pretty radical, but no more of this working in an office in the US as, and, and jumping back and forth as um, we tend to do in, in development. We need to ground ourselves in the culture and the context of where we are and what we were doing. Um, and that's when I decided to move to Mexico permanently. Now, the second uh, philosophy was about how technologies are developed, especially in a development context. Um, we noticed this tendency to develop technologies for poor people. Technologies that we, none of us here use, right? But that are good enough for those who are less well off. This is another form of, of disconnect. So we developed what we call our skin in the game philosophy. Uh, deciding to develop low cost technologies but that are independently verified and certified. Um, ones that we use ourselves in our own houses with our own families. Now the third philosophy is that we decided after our experiences that we're not gonna enter vulnerable communities directly anymore. Instead, we're gonna link up with grassroots organizations, community leaders, community organizations. We're not gonna define the problems ourselves. Instead, we listen. And when we started doing that here in this region, the answer to the problem we always heard was water. There's not enough of it, and the water we do have is contaminated with things that we don't fully understand. And uh, because of that, Caminos de Agua exists today with our mission to improve human health and community well-being through adequate and affordable access to clean water. But what does that mean? What is clean water? You know, when we think of clean water, I think we tend to think of water that's free of these guys, right? Pathogens. The little monsters that live in the water and they cause diarrhea, vomiting, dehydration, um, and, and even death, especially in children. Now, this is obviously incredibly important. But today, we no longer have the luxury to only worry about pathogens in, in, in our drinking water. We now live in a new reality where uh, emerging chemicals are contaminating water supplies around the globe. Uh, synthetic chemicals like pesticides, uh, industrial runoff. There's a crisis with lead in Flint, Michigan. Many of you may have heard something called PFAS, also more commonly known as forever chemicals, a really ominous term there. Um, and these are, these are chemicals that don't naturally break down in the environment and they're getting into our water supplies. Um, and there are also even some other chemicals that naturally exist deep in the groundwater, in our aquifers, beneath our feet. For example, here in our region, in the northern part of Guanajuato, uh, we, we've been over-exploiting our groundwater, which is our primary water source for decades. Now this has caused our water table to drop precipitously about two to three meters per year. This is some of the most overexploited groundwater in the entire world. Now that obviously has 
to force us to dill, drill our wells deeper and deeper, and we're starting to extract fossil water. This is water that's increasingly contaminated with naturally occurring arsenic and fluoride here in our region. So essentially, the deeper we go into our groundwater, the more concentrated these contaminants are becoming. Now, we have uh, registered arsenic levels upwards of 23 times above the World Health Organization limits, and exposure to these contaminants causes irreversible impacts on health. For instance, fluoride, which we need a certain amount of fluoride, it's necessary for human health, but in the concentrations we see it impacts teeth, bones, and even cognitive development and learning disabilities in children. Now the first most visible sign of, of fluoride toxicity is the permanent staining of teeth called, called dental fluorosis, which marks a child for life. Arsenic is even worse. Uh, Long-term exposure to even relatively low levels of arsenic um, is associated with all sorts of, of chronic conditions, um, and even several types of cancer. So after seeing these health impacts in Bangladesh, the World Health Organization called naturally occurring arsenic in the groundwater, quote, the largest mass poisoning of a population in history. Now the main culprit, here in our region at least, is industrial agriculture, which uses 85% or more of our groundwater. Now much of this is for export to the US and other foreign markets, um, so essentially the unsustainable amount of water used to get broccoli on our kitchen tables is causing irreparable damage on the water quality and quantity, as well as the public health of hundreds of thousands of people here in our region. And here in Guanajuato is a microcosm of these incredibly serious water challenges we're facing today uh, here in Mexico and, and well beyond across the globe. We estimate about 21 million people and 300 million people globally are exposed to alarming levels of arsenic and fluoride in their water. Um, and these are just two examples of this new class of chemical contaminants that are disproportionately impacting low-income rural communities around the world. Now, the common accessible treatment options we have, like boiling water, simple water fil filtration, even more technical options like ultraviolet light um, and carbon, none of these things can remove arsenic and fluoride and many other chemical contaminants from the water. This is the challenge that we face. So the first program we ever started um, here in Caminos de Agua back in 2011 was our water quality monitoring program. Um, we partnered with universities, grassroots organizations, and to date we've tested well over 600 sites here in our region, um, but we've also partnered nationally to make thousands of, of water quality data points uh, publicly available around the country. Now an important part of this work is, um, is going back to the communities and informing them of their water quality, and also some other information on what they can do. So a very brief story on this. Back about a decade ago, when I was still much more in the field than I am today, um, we were in a community with some of the highest levels of water contamination we had ever registered. Now, we had just been there a year prior to inform them of this bad news, and we were just coming back to do some follow-up studies. And I was kind of casually talking to some of the families while the technical people were doing what, what they did. Um, and I remember this young girl there, she was a young adolescent girl, about 11 or 12 years old, and she had severe dental fluorosis already. Her teeth were completely brown to black. And I was actually talking to her mother. And her mother was, was saying how difficult it is for her daughter in school because of her teeth. And she continued talking, and then she said something like, and, you know, I hardly ever bathe anymore. And I try to make sure my daughter only does so once a week or so, but you know, that's really hard again because of school. And she continued talking, and I kind of just stopped listening because in that moment, it had hit me so hard. We had generated such a fear of water in these families that they were afraid to even touch it, which is honestly a pretty logical response, right? Except for the fact that we had forgotten to tell them, I, I had forgotten to tell them, that arsenic and fluoride are not absorbed through the skin. The risk is in consuming it. So the impacts of our actions, and in this case our inactions, can reverberate deeply. Um, this is the kind of thing that can happen when, when the technical or, or the, the academic is divorced from the humanity. Now we have a responsibility to do better. And I'd like to think from there we learned. So today, Caminos de Agua is much a technical organization as we are a social or, or a human organization. We have engineers that work hand in hand in the field with community organizers to try and do better, to try to create that marriage between technology and humanity. Now, when we first started looking uh, to, at how to deal with these new complex chemical contaminants, realizing just how hard arsenic and fluoride are to remove from the water, it honestly made sense to look for an entirely different water source altogether. So we turned to the rain. Now, 
Rainwater is incredibly easy to harvest off roofs and store in these big uh, cisterns, and it also happens to be inherently free of arsenic and fluoride and other potentially harmful chemicals. Now, when we partner it with a, a simple water filter to deal with those pesky pathogens, right? Um, like this one we produce in Caminos de Agua, and we also distribute throughout the country with partner organizations. This combination allows us to have an incredibly safe, affordable, and high-quality source of safe drinking water. Now, through these technologies, we've partnered with over 120 mostly rural communities, um, uh, NGOs, other government agencies, but most importantly with grassroots organizations and community leaders and community organizers. In that way, we are trying to create models that generate lasting change on the health and well-being of people and communities. So together, we've been able to directly impact close to 45,000 people throughout Mexico to date, but it's not nearly enough. So that's why we've also spent the last six years developing what we call our groundwater treatment system. This is a community scale treatment plant that removes arsenic and fluoride, and it can be designed to deal with all sorts of other contaminants. So for the price of just one rainwater harvesting system that will serve one family, we can install a groundwater treatment system that serves 40 families. And it can be scaled uh, far beyond that, providing safe uh, drinking water to thousands of people per system. Now this system is incredibly simple. It's really easy to use and understand, and it's made with locally available materials, and most importantly, it was proven under real-world conditions. Now, we've worked with numerous researchers, university partners to design every aspect of the system, but I'm not gonna go into any of that here today, because we know that it technically works. The most important innovation with this system isn't technical at all, it's social, it's human. This first system, located in a small rural community called Los Ricos, um, it's completely owned and operated by a group of women who came together initially because they were concerned about the health of their children. And now, today, they are in charge of their entire community's first source of clean drinking water. Now, at first, these women were nervous to even open up a valve. And today, now, now they are independently monitoring the system, they're troubleshooting it, they're fixing leaks, they're even testing water quality and, and taking payments, making this both operationally and economically sustainable over time. Now this model took time to build, and we built it together. And, and honestly, that's what we need, because a technology is not a solution. If we're gonna solve these increasingly complex challenges, water or otherwise, we need to create this marriage between technology and humanity. To achieve that, we have to design technologies that address these new challenges that we're facing with the people who are actually affected by them. That is how we create lasting solutions. Thank you so much.